Hello, 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 and welcome back to Alice Talks Football, and welcome back to another live Manchester United news, transfer news, takeover news, and general news show. We've got lots of interesting information coming in, reports coming out that Tenor's going to have a war chest in January, allowing to bring in lots of players. Jim Ratcliffe's going to give a money to suspend, according to some reports. Could it be PR spin? What's the reliability of that? We will get into that. We've also got reports in the dressing room saying that for the most part, most of the players are happy with Ten Hag, but there are a few that aren't happy with Ten Hag and we'll get into that as well and what the situation seemed to be with Ten Hag. Information on Ratcliffe coming in, his plans. But in Jake was went on the United Stand today and he dropped a lot of interesting information, among many things that we'll speak about, like Ten Hag's future, where United are at, the fixture is coming up, uh, news on Sancho going to Saudi, news on Amrabat not being wanted anymore, News on Casemiro going to Saudi, news on United in this big midfield overhaul, news on Jao Neves, Anana, the Everton midfielder, <coughs> and more. So lots to get into in today's show, so please do hit that like button and of course subscribe down below to Alice Talks Football if you're new. And as Alex has said here in the chat, it's going to be a deafening month when we come back from the break. Our recent play will not cut it against the better sides. And I think you do make a point because I actually wanted to get into this and discuss this, but we've got a real, real nasty run of games coming up and this, this could be make or break in in the season for Eric Ten Hag here. So let me get this up for you guys here. As you can see on the screen, I'm going to share the screen with you guys here. We've got Everton, which is a difficult game because Everton are in a lot better form than people think. They started off really, really poor, Everton. Look at that. Win, draw, win, loss, win. Uh, they've got 10 points. They're actually top. They're with Man United. They're in the top five of the form table on recent form. So we've got the likes of Everton, who are in much better form. Obviously, Galatasaray away. Galatasaray away is going to be a very, very difficult game. Then we've got Newcastle away, which is going to be a very difficult game. I know they've got injuries, but when they went to Old Trafford, they literally played their C team and beat us 3-0 and played us at the park. Um, and I think with Newcastle, they're probably the hardest working team in the Premier League. And we struggle when teams outrun us. Uh, Chelsea, which have given every big team a, a big game. To be honest, considering Spurs had nine men, maybe Chelsea weren't impressive versus Spurs. But they gave City a run for their money. And I think Chelsea could cause United problems. Bournemouth, that should be a win. Bayern Munich, then Liverpool. So I'm looking at this here and I'm thinking Everton's difficult, but we can beat them. Galatasaray's difficult, but we can beat them. Newcastle, I think they'll win. Chelsea, I think they'll give us a run. Bournemouth, I think we'll win. Bayern, not much hope. Liverpool at Anfield, no hope because we just lose 7-5 and five bloody nil when we go. West Ham are a decent form. They've dropped off a bit. I think we can win that. Villa, I think, will beat us. Forest, I think we can win. Tottenham depends on the injury situation. Wolves I think we can win, and then you get the gist of it. But you you look at you look at the run of games coming up, and it is going to be very very difficult. I won't lie by saying I am the slightest bit concerned as well. Uh, my biggest concern so far is we've lost to any club of quality we played so far this season, which is true. We haven't actually won a game against someone that were like, okay, they're a good side. I think maybe had we got that Romero penalty and gone one up against Spurs, it would have been a different game early in the season but the best team we've probably beat is Brentford which isn't good actually because if we look at the table and teams we've beaten lost to City lost to Arsenal lost to Spurs lost to them in the Carabao Cup lost to Brighton yeah Brentford 11th Wolves 12th we beat Forest 15th Fulham 16th and then these three teams at the bottom so wow Burnley have been dreadful so Alex does make quite a good point there. But listen, people, please do hit that like button and, of course, subscribe down below if you're new. Share the video as well. Newcastle's injuries might be a different game. Newcastle have been hit with injuries, just like United, I have to say. Lots going down in Newcastle, lots going down in Spurs. A lot of our ri rivals have been hit with bad injuries as well, whereas we've obviously had bad injuries all season. So it will be interesting to see how the injury situation and things on the injury front of things uh, change for rivals. Will rivals start to drop more points? Because I think the weird thing about this season is we all of our rivals start this season so well, whereas we start so badly, so we definitely look further off than we are. But if rivals start to have the injuries that we had at the start of the season, maybe they drop off and maybe there's chances for us to catch up. First in the form table, as we keep saying, you never know, you never know. But I do want to dive into the news. I do want to dive into information. I do want to dive into all the stories coming out. So make sure you've hit that like button. And of course, please do subscribe down below if you're new. Um, I've got lots and lots of information that's interesting, and I'm going to dive right into it. So first of all, I want to talk about what Ben Jacobs has said on, said on the takeover. Ben Jacobs went on the United Stand today, and he said some interesting things on the takeover. Then I'm going to get into some news about stuff going on in the dressing room, and then I'm going to get into a little bit of 
transfer news. So Ben Jeek has went on the United stand today and said it is likely that Sir Jim will come next. He said it's likely that Sir Jim announcement will come next. He says, I sense from talking to sources, it won't jump straight from 25 to 69% in terms of total ownership. It's going to be similar to Leeds, where there was a couple of um, inc incremental investments over time. That seems to be the case within about three years of the expectation that the Glazers will be gone. It was said by Ben Jacobs that football um, control will change to Surgeon Ratcliffe and brand control will remain in the hands of the Glazers. That has also been confirmed by the likes of Ornstein and Romano that the brand, the commercial side, is going to be completely owned by the Glazers. But football control and all of that will be in the hands of Surgeon Ratcliffe, where we know that he's looking to bring in Blanc, Paul Mitchell, among many more people as well. Well, um, someone said there's no there's no thumbnail. I, I don't know if there's the thumbnail working. Do let me know as well. Continuing on, Ben Jacobs said, I don't think we'll get... And Ben Jacobs said this, which is very different to what else was said, but Ben Jacobs said this, I don't think we'll get a crazy box office January. This is more about getting in, stabilising the club and sorting out the hierarchy, make sure the dynamics of Ratcliffe and the Glazers work, and then you've got half a year to plan the summer. So some sources are saying we're going to get a big January Ben Jacobs was saying from what he believes, it's more about Ratcliffe coming in and doing like the stuff that needs to be done to stabilise the clubs in terms of structure, Paul Mitchell, Blanc, and then plan for a big, big summer. That is what Ben Jacobs suggests. But he said that he, he will be categori categorically, I can't say the word, categorically convinced that he'll have power and control of the football side and as a result will be able to influence the football club is what Ben Jacobs said on Ratcliffe's control. Ben Jacobs is seeming confident that Ratcliffe will be given enough control to make the necessary changes happen and those changes actually be able to impact United. And we know that from Romano, Ornstein and now Ben Jacobs that Paul Mitchell has moved back to Manchester and wants to be United's next sporting director while nothing is official it looks likely. When you've got Fabrizio Romano saying it's likely, when you've got top sources saying that Ratcliffe wants Mitchell and when you've got top sources saying that Mitchell wants to join Ratcliffe and come to United and Ratcliffe has moved back to Manchester because he wants to be close. Sorry, Mitchell has moved back to Manchester because he wants to be closer than home. It looks like Paul Mitchell is very, very close to a Manchester United move as well. Now, other things that came in as well, it was said by Den Jacobs that after Sergio Ratcliffe's initial £250 million investment into Manchester United, there will be plans in place to invest not only in the football club, but the strategy, modernisation and stadium re redevelopment. Now, while Sergio Ratcliffe will not build us a new stadium like Qatar promising, he's looking to modernise the stadium facilities and put a strategy in place so United aren't about 100 years behind all their rivals and still the only Premier League club without a big screen in the stadium as well. It was said that Sergeant Ratcliffe believes that there's a $2 billion is the ballpark needed for investment. So apparently he's willing to invest $2 billion into United and an initial $300 million will go in this year. And the remaining $1.7 billion Sergeant Ratcliffe has put aside for future projects, including improving the team and facilities as well. But he's willing to pump $300 million into United already, which is good. And some of that will go towards the transfer window. It was said that Sergeant Ratcliffe wants to be remembered as the man that turns Manchester United's fortunes around. And that is the most interesting statement is that Sergio Ratcliffe wants to be known as a guy that's turned Man United's fortunes around. He wants to be known as a guy that's come in and improved, improved Manchester United and brought Manchester United back. Do I think that Sergio Ratcliffe is going to be that guy? Not necessarily. Do I think Sergio Ratcliffe is going to come to United and make us amazing? Not necessarily. But do I think Sergio Ratcliffe will come to United, put the right structure in place, get the right people in place and put Manchester United in a much better position than they would be if the Glazers were here? I do. While he's not coming in like Qatar and building a new stadium and completely getting rid of Joe and Avram Glazer, it's very obvious that he's got so much money with Ineos that he's not using United to make money. He's kind of looking at United as, a, I want to be known, you know, as a guy that's helped United bring them back. I, I, I want to put the right structure in place because we are a club that is so big that it's not like we need Qatar money to be successful because we are a club that's so big. Man City would have needed that kind of money to be successful. PSG would have needed that money, kind of money to be successful. But clubs like Man U, Arsenal and Liverpool are so big that they don't need Middle Eastern money to be successful. But what they do need is to be run properly. And that is what we don't have. Arsenal and Liverpool have had problems with their owners. Uh, Manchester United have the most problems with their owners, but we are run shambolically. So if Sergio Ratcliffe is coming in and he's taking over the complete sporting side of United and running things properly... I expect to see an improvement, but the only thing is it might be a long term project because he's only going to get 25 percent. It's not a full sale. We still want the full sale. We still got to push for the full sale with the protest because when he got 25 percent, how much is, 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 is Joel Glazer going to allow him to do in three years when he has 69 percent? He can do a load. But, you know, he's only got 25 percent. And I think that will be 
the interesting thing to see how much he can do as well. Um, Jim isn't investing billions unless he buys um, a further stake. Why would he invest that much as a minority investor? Exactly. I think, as they said, he would he'd invest an initial 300 million. And then if he has 69 percent, then he would invest billions. Alex is spot on with that. Probably should have mentioned that as well. Um, and to Gaz says he'll be known as the guy that saved the Glazers. He wants to be known as the guy that saved United. For now, he's known as the guy that saved the Glazers. The way Sergio Macklin's going to establish himself is if he comes to United, he brings in the right people, he gets us right on back, back on track, he, he spends money, he invests in the club, and then he actually does make the stadium look good and does make the facilities look good. And we start actually being in a title race and looking like a team that's going to challenge for the league every season. Then Sergio Macklin can be known as the guy that saved United. But if we are sitting here in three years' time with Sergio Macklin's got 69%, a big fat mess, as bad as we've always been, then you've got to go, yeah, he is the guy that saved the Glazers. I think <laughs> what he does will determine how he's known as well. Uh, he's known as the guy who buys the club partially and didn't buy out the Glazers. If he has so much money, why not make an offer that the Glazers can refuse? Which is my point. I, I think it's what annoys me about this Ratcliffe situation is, if you're such a Man United fan, why are you getting into bed with the Glazers and, and buying, you know, such a small amount of the club? You, you're meant to be a Man United fan, but you only want this amount of the club and that amount of the club. And yeah, I really don't like it, to be honest. Um, I've always been pretty clear that I want Qatar because Qatar is a full sale. And it wasn't that, you know, I wanted Qatar and no one else. It's just that I wanted the full sale. And Sergio Ratcliffe hasn't given us a full sale. If it was Glazers stay for 10 years or we get Sergio Ratcliffe in for 25%, I'm taking Sergio Ratcliffe in for 25%. I always try and be positive. I think he'll be like FSG. I think he'll be like Kronke where he's not going to be the golden owner, but he's definitely going to be improvement on the Glazers. But it is that frustration of why can't you just have put a bid in for the full club? Why did you have to, you know, go for 25%? And the reason it is because he knew he couldn't beat Qatar for 100% of the club. He didn't have the financial capabilities to beat Qatar for the hundred percent of the club, so he's gone with twenty five percent, and he and he's laid into what the Glazers wanted, which is very smart from Jim Ratcliffe because he gets what he wants. But from a United fan perspective, it's like, well, you've you've stopped the full sale. So I do get frustration there towards Sir Jim Ratcliffe. Say, look, he's coming in. It's not Qatar. It's not full sale. He's coming in. But if he does bring in Paul Mitchell, he does bring in Blanc, and he does eventually buy the Glazers. While it'll be a little bit longer, there could be chances for success as well, and stability in the club structure is needed as well. Stability in the club structure is probably one of the most important things and smarter recruitment is the first step. But the debt, old traffic and facilities will need to be addressed ASAP, unclear if Jim will do so. And I think Alex sums that up pretty well. I think <coughs> that's what we want to know about Sir Jim. That's what we want to know if Sir Jim will add or not. So he wants to be known as the guy that's, he wants to be remembered as the man that turned United's fortunes around. But to do that, we need their debt to be lowered. We need a uh, nice investment, nice recruitment, a stable structure, and we need some new facilities. Now, Ben Jacobs said a few interesting more things on Ratcliffe. He said, what Ratcliffe essentially says is, I want to be the saviour. This is more good narcissism as opposed to bad narcissism, which creates a situation where there's disconnect between the fans and the owners, which I don't really get because, do you know why I don't get this? Because apparently the Glazers were insulted that Qatar was saying they want to bring Man United back. You know how Qatar was saying in their statements, we're going to bring Man United back, we're going to restore Man United. The Glazers got so offended when Qatar was saying, oh, we're going to bring Man United back. But when Sergeant Ratcliffe says, I want to be Man United's saviour, all of a sudden it's it's meant in a good way and the Glazers aren't offended by that. It's just like, you know what? The Glazers don't care. It's just that they know that Sergeant Ratcliffe's given them what they want and they're not going to kick up a fuss about it. They get to stay a little bit longer. They get to milk a bit more money out of the club as well. Um, an interesting thing that's been mentioned is obviously the relationship with Nice, the Todabo deal, a few other things going around with the takeover and it was said by Ben Jacobs that there could be a relationship where players can be loaned to Ineos clubs like Nice and Lausanne but it, I'd be cautious because Sir Jim wants Man United I would absolutely wouldn't rule out Sir Jim scaling back on that as well so I'm just going to a quick sip of water and then explain what that means essentially he's saying Sir Jim wants United but he might just lose a bit of interest in Nice and his other clubs however there's also a voting going in place to see if you can like loan clubs if you can loan players, so you know how like Man City loaned Frank Lampard from their, their sister club in America and how Newcastle are linked to loaning Neves as a way to get around FFP. Because people are worried that the Saudi is going to buy loads and loads and loads and loads of players and then just loan them to Newcastle so Newcastle can get around FFP. It's a way of cheating. There might be a new rule that goes in place before the January transfer window, which means you can't loan players. So we could have been in the situation where potentially we could have loaned Turham or potentially could have loaned Tonobo at United, but that might not be able to be the case. Um, as well, but definitely deals could happen on the cheap between the clubs. It was also said as well, there are feeling 
feelers being put out there that Ineos and Sir June Ratcliffe may look uh, for investment into Nice as well and that actually they might focus their attention on United. Uh, nice actually unbeaten in, in league earn right now on their best form as well. And it was said that Sir Jim Ratcliffe will look um, into more than just results when it comes to making a decision about Tenark. He will also look at his personality and strategy. So there was a few reports coming out and rumours this week, actually, that um, Sergeant Ratcliffe was planning on sacking Ten Hag and that Sergeant Ratcliffe wasn't a fan of Ten Hag, but it didn't come out from the most reliable sources. In fact, it came out from pretty shocking sources. And I think that's proven to be BS um, as well. I think it's a situation where Sergeant Ratcliffe gets in, he gets people like Paul Mitchell and Blanc in, he assesses the results, he assesses the relationship with the players, he assesses the situation, he assesses the total replacements around, and then he will choose. I think Ten Hag's job is safe until the Jim Ratcliffe deal is ratified. And some reports are saying that the Jim Ratcliffe deal is going to be ratified this week. But I think when, when I mean ratified, I mean when he's really established and got some stuff in place, which would be December. So I do think that, um, that Ten Hag's job is safe for at least another month. I don't think United will do anything while the Surgeon Ratcliffe deal is underway because Surgeon Ratcliffe will have sporting control. But Surgeon Ratcliffe and whoever he employs will have obviously a big say on Eric Tenog's future at the club. Do let me know down below, guys, if you are Tenog in or Tenog out. Personally, I'm Tenog in because if we sat Tenog, we are stuck with Darren Fletcher to the end of the season. I'm critical of Tenog. I will be critical of Tenog, but I generally am so fed up with sacking managers every two years and crap recruitment. I want the changes at the top to happen. I want to see how Tenog does with changes at the top and how different it is when he gets the right recruitment. And then I personally want to judge Tenog. But I'm really intrigued to see your thought process on all that as well. If loans transfer bans go through between parent clubs, uh, the, the right the RB clubs are sunk. Absolutely, that's going to hit the RB clubs more than anyone else. But I think it's because it's like the RB clubs almost do it in a good way, where they'll loan like younger players between each other and get them experience and then bring them back because the Australian league's not as good as the Bundesliga. They do it in like a better way. Whereas I think the prob the reason they're doing it is because they're like, okay, Saudi Arabia could just go and spend a hundred million on a player and then load it to Newcastle. I think it's the Saudi money which is which is scaring people kind of with that rule going in as well. People saying ten arg in, Eric ten arg in. A lot of you guys are ten arg in. Guys, please do hit that like button if you have not already, and of course subscribe down below if you're new. We've got over three hundred people watching, so let's see if we can hit the like target as well. Why is that the best manager we've had in years? Says Jackie Harvey, and I actually do think ten arg is the best manager we've had in years. I, I actually do agree with that as well. Anyway, we've got some really interesting stories on Jaden Sancho, Rafa Varane, Amrabat and Casemiro that I want to get into. I want to get into the transfer front and then we will discuss a little bit more news and information coming out. So this was said by Leonas, Leonas Costas today. He said, breaking, Sir Jim Ratcliffe will give Eric Ten Hag a transfer war chest in January to overhaul his squad. United are willing to listen to offers for Anthony, Sancho and Martial in the January window. And Eric Ten Hag is targeting a forward that could play on both flanks and potentially even a right back. Other reports have come out and said that Manchester United could even be willing to listen to offers for Casemiro and Baran as Manchester United are planning to do a big overhaul of players with high-wage, big-name players potentially off to Saudi Arabia. It's been said that Jim Ratcliffe could come to Manchester United and give Ten Hag the money he needs to spend, depending on how Manchester United's season is looking. If Manchester United's season is looking particularly worrying about them qualifying in the top five or top four for a Champions League place, there's a feeling that Ten Hag could be given a lot of funds. The priority ahead of the January window is a right winger, but if the right centre mid, right centre back became available for the right price or even the right striker, Manchester United would act on that if they have the funds available, which uh, Jim Ratcliffe may be willing to provide, is what it said on the transfer thing. Now, United NAD about a month ago spoke about midf <coughs> midfielders that United were looking at and got some inside re reports as well. And he said that he got told again that United currently don't have a plan to sign a six, but that, that will depend change depending on what happens with Amrabat and Casemiro. Now, a month after we said that, we've got reports coming out that Amrabat and Casemiro are not in the long-term plans. But it is said by the United NAD that Man United were looking to focus on a more physically dominant number eight when it comes to midfielders. The clubs are also very happy with Mayno and Mejbri's development. Eric Tenag remains a big fan of Amrabat as well. So, 
that was said a month ago. Now we're getting information coming out that Tenog is ready to ship off Amrabat. Tenog is ready to ship off Casemiro. But it was said that Tenog's actual ideal profile is a dominant eight. Now, the reason Tenog wants a physically dominant eight and the reason Tenog might be going and moving towards someone like McTominay is that United do have a lack of height in the midfield. And when Lissandra Martinez returns, there'll be a lack of height in the defence. It was said while Manchester United are a big fan of Andre, um, who is at Fluminense, they would, they would bring him in alongside someone like Anana. Uh, Andre is obviously the Fluminense player, great young player, but he's tiny. And I think United are in a position where they do need two midfielders. They need a six, they need an eight, or they need a pairing of players that can play in the pivot together. Other players that Manchester United are a big fan of are the likes of Palacios as well. Some of the names that United are looking at ahead of the midfield is Anana of Everton, Fafana, Ilicic, Jao Nevers, Drewsbury Hall and Boehner. Manchester United also have an interest in Palacios, according to United Mapeteers, but United Ned said he didn't hear anything about Palacios. Um, however, so Palacios, I see is more an Ericsson replacement. I also see us looking at a long-term six. I see us looking at someone physical as well. But the interesting thing is a month after this report came out that the Muppeteers did say it's likely that Casemiro will go to Saudi at some stage and Amrabat won't get signed permanently. And talking of Saudi, they look like they could be doing a big raid of United, which is what I want to get into. And a bit more about Penn Jacob, what Ben Jacob spoke about is that Saudi Arabia could be willing to go for both Fran Casemiro and Sancho in January and this links back to the article that we were talking about earlier that United could have a big January transfer window because there could be a raid of like three four five players in January a big Saudi raid where United could be bringing in a lot of uh, could be raising a lot of money now I don't necessarily think that certain players will leave in January unless United have a clear replacement in mind I think it will be quite difficult but I do want to get into what was said ahead of the January transfer window it said heading to the Middle East remains an option for Jadon Sancho, who's desperate to leave United. Now, that was said by Talk Sport. But Ben Jacobs said on the United Stand earlier today that Jadon Sancho to Saudi Arabia is a possibility. That um, The interest is there, but it depends if the player wants to move. Saudi Arabia definitely want Jadon Sancho. Neymar is injured. They're looking at Neymar replacements. Sancho to Saudi Arabia is generally a genuine possibility, but it's all about does Sancho want the move? I've heard things about Sancho, which make me think that he would never go to Saudi Arabia. Um, but you never know. He could go there for a little bit. He's desperate to get out of United. And because of his high wages, many clubs might go uh, in for him. It was said by Ben Jacobs that Manchester United were open to letting Sancho go to Al Etihad on the Saudi deadline day. However, only if it included a mandatory buy clause of 50 million. Now, I think Man United could have maybe got 50 million for Sancho from Saudi in the summer, but because S Sancho desperately wants out, is refusing to play, Man United have no bargaining power where they might have to literally sell Sancho for like 20 million because of the situation. It was said with Neymar injured and Neymar's out for the rest of the season, Al Halal is a team that are keeping an eye on Jadon Sancho and he could be their first choice to replace Neymar for a season. Um, there's also a few German clubs interested in Sancho, like, of course, Borussia Dortmund and Juventus and Roma have had an interest in Sancho. It said that Manchester United do need to clear out some squad space and Al Etihad, Etihad are also got an interest on Varane, but there's no there's no insurances that Tenag will let him leave in January. Obviously, this report's coming out that Rafael Varane has been unhappy with his lack of game time, but he is a very big professional and a move would be more likely in the summer. Tenag is ready to get rid of big name players and clear out some space in the squad and clear out the wage bill and potentially Varane and Casemiro could be leaving in the summer. Ben Jacob said that Casemiro is a name that Saudi clubs have on their list for summer 2024. However, due to his injury status, any move in January isn't likely. It was said by Ben Jacobs that <laughs> Casemiro wants to see out the season with United and see what happens in the summer, see what his form, if his form returns, if his injuries return, all of that. And Al Hilal and Al Ahi are potential suitors in the Saudi Pro League. So Saudi Arabia are also looking at Bruno Fernandes, but there's no indication that Bruno Fernandes would want to move to Saudi Arabia anytime soon. But Sancho Varane and Casemiro are three Manchester United players that are being heavily looked at by Saudi Arabia. And there's a feeling that they could be willing to spend 40 million on Sancho, 40 million on Varane and 40 million on Casemiro. And United in 2024 could potentially raise up to 120 million to the Saudi league. But I think that's unlucky un unlikely just because we know as, as, as a United fan, how bad United have been at selling players. Wonder if they're going to sell Varane. Varane could leave in January, but from what I'm hearing, I think it's unlikely. I think we are a big fan of Todibo, but because of Martin as an injury record, because of Evans being injured, I don't think that Varane will go just yet. I think that Varane and Tenag will make up. I think their situation isn't too bad. I think the media are exaggerating the fallout between that as well. Apparently the focus is way out. I do apologise for that. 
Let me just grab a quick drink of water and then I want to get into the next story. I do apologise if the focus went out. I can't see the, the camera on my screen because I was just reading like that really, really long article. Really long article there as well. We need Nico Williams and Noosa in January. One or the other. Nico Williams is my first choice. Noosa is my second choice. I'm going to ask you guys a question before I get to the next report because the next report is about potential rifts going on in the dressing room. And my question for you guys is do let me know in the chat down below if you could bring in anyone in January realistically. Let's say we get 80 million to spend in January. So you could spend that on one player, two player, three player. If you could bring anyone realistically in January, who would you bring in? I'm intrigued because part of me would like to go with Todabo, 40 million, and Nico Williams because he's got six months left on his contract, could be 25 million. And then maybe you get Marcus Leonardo for the remaining 15 million. Another part of me is like, do we go for Anana of Everton about 40, 50 million? Do we go for Andre, 40, 50 million? <coughs> um, it's, it's an interesting one. I, I think I would probably go Todibo and a right winger in Nico Williams and then uh, Marcus Leonardo, young striker. And then I think in the summer, I would sp focus the whole summer on rebuilding the midfield and just putting in some final tunes, depending on who leaves and who goes. I think in the summer, I would be looking at that six role. I'd be looking at that eight role, but... Really intrigued to see what you guys would do in the January window as well. Will Varane stay healthy? Most likely not. He can go. Good luck. I think Varane's injury record is something that is frustrating Eric Tenag as of now as well. Some, someone said to sell Martinez. I would not sell to Sandra Martinez. I know he's had a bit of an injury record, but I think he, it's the same injury. And it's because we're rushing him back. I think if we actually get him over that injury and don't rush him back, we'll be fine as well. Alice. I think United should replace Sancho with Ernest Poku from AZ. He's only 19 in the same nut type as Doku. His market value is only 900 k says Lucas from Day K. That's a good point there, Lucas. Um, <coughs> I've heard a lot about that guy. I haven't actually really watched him, but I've heard, I've heard good things about that guy. Um, could be a potentially smart replacement there. So let's go into the reports on the United dressing room because there's a few players that reportedly unhappy with Eric Tenag. So let's dive into these news. Let's dive into the information about the relationships with certain players who aren't getting game time and Eric Tenag and what their problems are. We know that Luke Shaw's come out, we know that Garnacho's come out and they've made it very clear they're backing Tenag. It was, it was quite public with them liking posts about Tenag not being the problem, which I like to see because there's been a lot of negative media reporting of Tenag lately. So it is nice to see that stuff. But it was said here uh, by Ben Jacobs <coughs> that there are a lot of senior players on Eric Tenog's side, uh, but there are some in the dressing room that feel that Eric Tenog's style of man management doesn't suit them personally. We know that Jaden Sancho is one of them. We know there's a few bigger names that have been frustrated with that. Ben Jacobs said, right now at Man United, I think there are too many players that have responded poorly to not being picked. Ben Jacobs says that while the majority of the dressing room backs Tenog, a few of the players that haven't been getting picked have been the ones responding poorly and not being the biggest fan of Tenog. Now, the ones that aren't being picked are Mason Mount, but he's looked really good when he's played. I think he's a top professional. I think he gets on with it. Amrabat's not really been picked. Uh, Varane's not really been picked. And of course, we know that Jaden Sancho was not happy. There's a few rumours about Varane fall out. For now, we know that Jaden Sancho's not happy. We know there's a few other players that are a little bit frustrated, but they're acting professional as far as I'm aware. But a few of the players that aren't being picked are reportedly the ones that have turned on Ten Hag, which could explain him constantly going with the same lineup as well. Pedro Inet is a good shout, but he's just got such a bad injury record. And I think with the injuries we've had this season, I wouldn't take a, list, um, a risk on Pedro Neto. And last season, compared to this season, has hurt Ten Hag. He's not had a full squad yet due to injuries. And I think last season, because Martial was always injured, he never had a full squad, but he always had a full squad apart from Martial with maybe one other, whereas this season he's had a full squad minus six or seven. He's just not. He's been six off a full squad, whereas last season he was often two. I think injuries this season have been a new level. Guys, what do you think Man United's best uh, 11 is when we have a full squad? I've, I've always wondered this because it's so hard to know what our best 11 is <laughs> because it, you can go on form, you can go on how they've played this season, you can go on uh, many things as well. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, 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 news, 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 news. I read that wrong. I read that wrong, but we're fine. We just got, I read that Rasmus Hoyland was going to be out for the season for some reason. I, I'm. He's not going to be out for the season. He's not. I, for some reason, I thought it said next November. Ericsson has got a knee injury and he's out for a month. So he'll probably miss two weeks because we've got a two week international break. Hoyland's got a muscle strain, but there's a hope he'll be back before the end of November. So, there's a feeling Hoyland will just be out for the international break. 
and Ericsson's out of a knee injury. I read that as hope he'll be back before next November. And I was like, wait, what? I started panicking. It's been a grim injury situation at United, but Ericsson will probably miss two weeks, which is three or four games. Hoyland may miss a game or two, but I think that is probably the most positive update we could get today. I, I was starting to panic when, when I saw that kind of news as well. Uh, Shaw has come out and said the manager's the full backing of the players, which is really, really good as well. Um, if you fell out with Varane, I'd question Eric Ten Hag's man management, given Rafael Varane's quality and accomplishments. He seems like such a humble player. I agree. If Ten Hag's fallen out of Varane, that's when you're a bit like, mm, that's interesting. But Varane representative came out and said, essentially, that the situation between Varane and Eric Ten Hag is fine. Varane's obviously personally a bit annoyed that he wasn't picked for tactical reasons, but he understands that Maguire had to fight for his place and he's got to fight for his place back as well. Uh, but we've got three more injuries and an illness. Uh, Shaw is looking to, likely to return after the break. wan is set to be fine. But of course, Ericsson and Hoyland do pick up an injury, but they're only expected to miss a game or two as well. Uh, Hoyland should be back in a couple of weeks before the end of November. International break it returns end of November. So Hoyland maybe might miss a game like Everton, but there's an expectation that he could be back for something like Galatasaray as well. If not, we're going to need Anthony Martial to turn up like Pele as well. Um, but Ericsson will be out for a bit, but Rasmus Hoyland could be, is expected to be back uh, with a muscle strain before the end of November as well. So the injuries shouldn't be too bad. The only problem is we've got such a big game against Galatasaray. We've got a big game against Newcastle, a big game against Everton. That Those are crucial games that they'll be missing. The Ericsson injury we can get around with the likes of Mason Mount. I think he's a, I personally think he's an upgrade on Ericsson, but I think the Hoyland injury is going to be a very, very difficult one to get around as well. But wan expected to be back and Luke Shaw also expected to be back very, very soon. Johnny Evans will also be out for a month as well. Um, I was hoping there wasn't going to be an injury to Ericsson and Hoyland, but when they missed the international break, I'm just kind of relieved that, it, that it's only a month on that injury front as well. Sancho and Harlan were frightening at Dort Dortmund. Yeah, Eric Tenag won't pair Sancho with Hoyland. I hope that Anthony comes good. Well, it's not that Eric Tenag won't pair Sancho with Hoyland. It's the fact that Sancho had a strop before Hoyland even played a game for United. Do you know what I mean? Sancho started having a strop and panicking and, and getting all annoyed four games into the season. If right now Sancho barely had a sniff and because An Anthony's been dreadful and Anthony, when he was in Brazil, Sancho had a barely had a sniff and he wasn't playing and Sancho had a strop, I'd be like, okay, I understand it. But Sancho had a strop after three games. Three games into the season, Sancho didn't start and had a strop. Three games. Just be a bit patient. If you'd have waited till November, you probably would have got a run of games, played with Hoyland and actually played quite well and have potential to save and revive his United career. I think, you know, right after Sancho's strop, Anthony has to stay in Brazil. Sancho would have got a run of games on the right wing, worked well with Hoyland, and that Sancho's only got himself to blame. A strop after not playing three games into the season. Yes, you had a decent preseason. Yes, you ended last season okay on the right. But to have a big strop like that and refuse to apologise after three games, Sancho was like looking, acting like a child. And I'm annoyed at Sancho because I think that Sancho, Hoyland and Rashford would work really well, or at least Garnacho, Hoyland and Sancho would work really well on that front three. I think Sancho and Hoyland would work fantastically well and Sancho would have got a run of games and a chance to prove himself. Maguire had to wait for his chance. Maguire's doing all right. Do you know what I mean? Certain players have had to wait for the chance and they get it and do it all right. But Tomlin's even getting the chance at the moment, not that I'm his biggest fan. So it always winds me up a little bit, that kind of situation as well. Uh, these stories about falling out with everyone is getting are getting too much. It is for tactical reasons. Players should suck it up and fight it. If the manager's fighting with everyone, he needs to adapt. I agree. I think the stories that the players are falling out with this and that, I think it's just media. I think the media know there's a lot of negativity around United with losing games. So I think they, it's Samuel Luckhurst and his dressing room sources spinning some negativity for clicks. I don't think that there's as many fallouts or beef going on as, as, as the media portray because as said by people, it's like this news has been known for months, but they're only leak it after a loss to kind of make it a lot worse as well overhaul is what manchester united need as well yes we do need a massive overhaul so let's dive a little bit into what united's best starting 11 is let's dive into a few other bits and pieces as well it does feel like we can never catch a break with these injuries but i'm glad that it might be two or three games that we miss but the one i'm worried about is galatasaray we've seen what hoyland's like in the uh, uh champions league we don't want him to be missing the galatasaray game but I want you to get involved with the last bit of the live stream here. What is United's best starting eleven? We're going to go off what I would have said it was going into the season and then what it probably is off form. So going into the season, I probably would have said, because Casemiro has been a little bit poor this season, but going into the season, I probably would have said our best um, 
a lineup would have had a Casemiro and Rabat Bruno midfield free. This is me going into the season. Like before all the crap happened, I would have and, and all the bad form and Rashford dropping off and everything like this. I would have said this would have been our best starting eleven. If everyone was fit, if there was no issues, if we, it was the start of the season and we were starting fresh, this is the starting eleven I would would have wanted to see. And then we're going to talk about what is our best starting eleven now. So let, do let me know yours down below. I'd probably say Wan Bissaka pips below, uh, just for defensive reasons. There, that would be right at the start of the season. If someone said, "What is Man United's best starting eleven?" I'm saying that at the start of the season, I'm saying that. I think a lot of other people are. Right now, we're in a situation where I don't know because Casemiro's not been great. I don't think Amrabat's been great, but he hasn't been given a run of games. Sancho, obviously, we know that situation. Anthony's been poor. So, so maybe is it is it is it gone natural on the right wing? Is it police during the right wing? Maybe you could say it's Ahmad, but he's not played. It's very difficult to know what our starting eleven is, and I think right wing and midfield is is that that one up for grabs. And part of me is like maybe Mount, maybe someone like Mount comes in here, and we hope that the midfield get better. And then another part of me is like may, maybe Rashford. Maybe Garnacho. I think that is like our best front three in a weird way. But then I don't think Garnacho is a right winger. And I don't think that Rashford's been particularly good. I mean, I'd maybe go with something like that. And then maybe you'd go with Mount. And, you, and then I guess if you know, would just don't know how good Amrabat's going to be. But I guess you would I guess you would say something like that. And then does Maino get in there? I mean, I, I know a lot of people would probably put Maino right here. You know, there's, there's big question marks about what the best starting eleven is right now. I think that is our best back five. Sean Martin is Ram Wan Bissaka. I think the only debate is Wan Bissaka for Ram. But I think that back five is our best back five. I think the big question mark is really right wing and these two spots behind Bruno. I think for me, I, I don't know what's works best. He's brought in Mason Mount. I think if he played Mason Mount deeper, it might work. I, I think. Do you know what's mad is I can't put him in here because. He he's not played a Premier League game, but in pre-season against Arsenal, it worked. I mean, let me get that up. Man United 2-0 Arsenal. If 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 we get that up here in pre-season, this lineup played really well versus Arsenal. And 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 it was this lineup here. It was Mason Mount, Kobe Mainu. It was look, it was our, it was our strongest team, but we didn't have a Nana at the time. But we that that that's why I would kind of want to see that Bruno Mount Mayno midfield because yes it's preseason but this was like the only preseason game we were good when we played the first team all the other preseason games were good we played the second team and part of me is like well we don't have Sancho because he's being being an idiot so part of me is like maybe maybe you play you replace Anthony with Rashford you got Hoyland for Sancho which is absolutely fine Hoyland comes in for Sancho Anthony comes in for Rashford and and maybe that is our best starting eleven but. There's always a big question mark about what's Man United's best starting eleven. I was a bit sceptical on Amrabat after making a point to watch some Serie A matches, but he surely deserves a chance with us. I think he's a better DM than McTominay. It's just that McTominay's got those goals. Because if you take away the goals, McTominay hasn't been that good over the last few games. I think he was all right, not the last game, the game before. I think he was all right in that Copenhagen game, but I don't think he's done enough to warrant performances. I think he's getting all those minutes based off the goals he scores as well. Uh, Maino owned Rice that game as well. Alice Rashford has one goal this season. Yeah, Anthony has none. Garnacho has none. Sancho has none. So who am I replacing Rashford in the front line with? Someone else that's got one goal this season. Do you see my point? Maybe maybe you try and mount at right wing and then bring Amrabat into the midfield there to add some balance with Maino or Casem maybe Casemiro, Maino, Bruno with Mount on the right and Rashford or Garnacho on the left and Hoyland up top as well. It, it's a big question mark over what United's strongest lineup is. But look, my nose is going to go. My throat is going to go. I am ill. So I'm going to have to wrap up the live stream here. But please do hit that like button if you have not already. And of course, subscribe down below. Big up everybody that tuned into today's live stream. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye.